our in our series here at Walking with the Stand. Just a couple of things. Uh, Cynthia had mentioned the revival that starts next Sunday through the following Wednesday at Alvarado Springs. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard Stephen Manley, but if you haven't, he's worth going to hear. Um, he just has a way of communicating that is just phenomenal. Um, and he's fun to listen to. He's not like the typical, oh, I'm going to fall asleep if I don't hear him. He's not like that at all. You will enjoy every bit of it. And so I would encourage you, it's Sunday through Wednesday, each night at 6.30. So if you have the opportunity, I would encourage you to go one or all of those nights to hear him. I promise you, you will be blessed by hearing him. And also, on the 15th of November, um, we had talked about having this same uh, missionary couple speak here. And it's like, that's crazy. Elder Edward Springs is only like 20 minutes from here. It's crazy for us to have the same person at two different churches. So instead of competing with each other, let's just combine together for that missionary service. And so on the 15th, that's what we're going to do that evening, um, is here the gays, who I believe are from Guatemala, I believe is where they're from. And I think... Um, it will be worth your while to hear them and hear what they have to say to you. And also, for those of you who uh, <coughs> may not have heard or um, didn't see it on Facebook, but today after service we are doing our membership class. And so we would love to have you if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, and we're going to provide pizza for that. As I was working on the sermon this week, I kept hitting this brick wall. And I found myself repeating what I said last week. And I'm like, Lord, I do not want to repeat. I don't want to do that. I've already said it. So help me to get past this wall. And so as I kept mulling it, it, it I, I just kept it, the same thing just kept happening over and over and over again. And this week, about, I think it was on Thursday, I was reading through Job. And I came across this verse that really kind of jumped off the page at me. And it kind of rephrased and reframed this whole sermon this morning. The bottom line of all of this and what we're going to talk about is decisions that we make in life can and probably will have a profound impact on our life and on those all around us. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. We sometimes think that, oh, these decisions I make only affect me. And we sometimes forget about those loved ones and our spouses and our kids and our grandkids that are there, that our decisions affect them as well. It's not just us. And so one piece of that whole process of, of our decision making comes down to what we believe. What do we truly believe in our heart? And sometimes those things that we believe have been founded on a faulty premise or a misguided premise in our lives. <coughs> and it leads us to making decisions and having this belief system that affects what we believe and the decisions we make. And they're not always good ones when we do that. And what we have to do is we have to begin to reframe that. On God's truth. And so when we make decisions, when we are basing what we believe, it needs to be based on God's truth, not what someone else has told us or something we've learned or what 
our neighbor says or our spouse says, but rather it needs to be based on the truth of God. And when we base it on that, we are going to make wise decisions in life. We talked last week, and, and I we, even this morning earlier was talking to someone about how the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy us. And boy, is he on a rampage now. We look around our society, we look around what's happening in our world, and right here in the United States, States and even right here in Missouri, and you just kind of shake your head and you're like, wow. So many decisions, so many things are being made not based on God's word, but based on what's right for me. It's become a very selfish society, a very selfish thing where we're so focused on ourselves. And it leads to this spiritual battle that's happening all across our nation and around our world. The, en the enemy is intent on deceiving us. He's intent on making sure that he can destroy us and getting us in this cycle of making poor decisions. And those poor decisions just keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And the next thing we know, we're so lost, we don't even know where we're at. We think that this decision we're making is so innocent. But in actuality, it's just going to destroy us in one way or another. We see this example throughout Scripture. Let me throw just a few of them out there. Eve. Eve was in the garden one day, and Satan comes along and says, Hey, have you noticed that fruit in the tree that's in the middle of the garden? You know, if you were to go eat that, you would be like God and would know the difference between good and evil. So, you know, that fruit looks really good, Eve. Why don't you go and take it, eat it? And we know what happens. She does. And she gives it to her husband, and he eats it. And they're thrown out of the garden. It didn't turn out well for her. Esau. Esau was so hungry that he's willing to give up his birthright to his brother simply for a bowl of soup and some bread. <laughs> David. David saw this beautiful woman on a housetop and he's like, I must have her. She's married. She's Uriah's wife. But no, he has to have her. So he goes through this scheming and ways of getting rid of Uriah so that he can have her as his wife. Oh, what tangled web we weave sometimes. Joseph's brother don't like him, and so they decide we're going to sell him into slavery. And they lie to their father and bring back his clothes covered in blood saying, oh, he must have been attacked by a wild animal. And so they go through this time of believing that he's dead while the brothers know full well what they've done, that they've sold him into slavery. Solomon, he thinks that having all of these wives from different countries was a wise thing to do. And it was a very stupid thing for him to do. <sighs> The rich young ruler who wasn't willing to give up his wealth to follow Christ, instead he decides to hold on to his wealth, and he thinks that's the wise decision to make. Ananias and Sapphira, they sell their property and they think, we're going to give it to the church, and they make the church believe we're giving it all to you, when in actuality they're holding part of it back. They've lied. 
And they pay a very big price for that lie. For you and me, maybe it's we think going in debt is a wise decision. Let me tell you, as someone that's been there, it's not. It's a very poor decision. We think, oh, I can go have this drink, or oh, I can go do this, or oh, if I do this drug, it's, it's okay. I'm only going to do it once. It's okay. No, it's not. Because it leads to this tumbling thing and cycle that happens in our life of poor decisions. And the next thing we know, we're lost in this cycle that happens. And we end up going down a path we wish we had never, ever gone down. The possibilities are endless. I could spend all morning sitting here naming things that we could do or get lost in. When we choose to live by the enemy's lies, it's going to lead to even more deception. And it's just going to lead to more unhappiness in our lives. There may be a temporary happiness, but it is a temporary happiness. There will be a price to pay for it. That's a long introduction for us getting into our passage here, but I'm going to read from several passages. I know the one that you have listed there is Job 4, 6, and we're going to read that one. But I'm also going to read from Psalms 1 and James 1. Job 4, 6. Is not your fear of God your confidence and the integrity of your ways your hope? Psalm 1, 1 to 3. How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in a season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. James 1. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. <laughs> I know as we read from, from um, Job, I know you're sitting there thinking, okay, didn't Job's friends lead him astray or try to lead him astray in his thinking? And the answer to that is yes, they did. And as you will know, if you read to the end of Job, God rebukes them for what they said and what they've done and, and how they tried to lead Job in their own way of thinking and to lead him astray from what was true. But what we do see in this first part of chapter 4 is, is that if you back up, you see that Job has lost almost everything. And he's stricken and afflicted. And he goes through this phase where he is like, I never should have been born. Woe is me. It's horrible. Why was I ever born? And you just see him going through this. And then in chapter 4, you see that Eliphaz, and, and I don't really know, but in my mind, this is how I view it. Eliphaz has had enough. Enough chose. Stop. And granted, Eliphaz has it wrong too, so I'm not saying that he has it right here, but he's finally heard enough and he's telling him, stop. Stop. 
And he says to him, is not your fear of God your confidence? And your integrity of your ways your hope? As misguided as he was, at least here, he has a point. And that's a wise thing for all of us. Sometimes our godly friends don't always lead us in the right direction. We need to be careful, and we need to be careful of the advice that we hear and we accept and we apply. Because not all of it is right. You see, when our focus gets taken off of God and it gets onto our situation or it gets onto whatever's happening in our life, we become so deceived, we can get so lost in that. And it's a dangerous place for us to be. Because when all our focus is on our problem, on what is right here in front of us, and it's not on God, we start making not wise decisions in our life. Because they're based on emotions, they're based on our circumstances, they're based on whatever's happening at that time. And we don't make the wise decisions. That's why in counseling, you know, you're told you need to not make decisions when you're in the height of something that's emotional or something that is grief, brings grief or whatever. You need to not make decisions at that time in your life. And so here, Eliphaz is saying to Job, you have provided strength to your friends. You have been there when people have been impatient and dismayed. You've been there for them. So Job, your fear is on God, which is where it should be. Your confidence, Job, is in your integrity. In your character. Wow. That's something all of us can learn from. Is our fear in God? Are we walking in a way of integrity, of character, that we don't have to be worried that we're going to fall or stumble or lead ourselves or someone else astray? There's a book that Andy Stanley wrote that I read a couple of years ago called The Best Question Ever. And in this book, basically it boils down, you can take the whole book and boil it down to, you need to ask yourself this one question. Is this the wise thing for me to do? It's a good question for all of us. Is the decision that I'm making, is the decision I'm about to make, is it a wise decision? Is it based on God's truth? Or am I basing it on my emotion? Am I going to regret this decision? We've all had buyer's remorse. We've all gone out and bought that thing and been like, when we get home, we're like, why on earth did I buy this? And if you're like Cynthia and I, you're taking it back to the store going, I'm sorry, I bought this on an impulse. I shouldn't have bought it. When we decide to stop and seek God's wisdom, when we stop and ask ourselves, what is the wise thing that we should do? When we seek him, when we seek in his word, we place ourselves in a position to make wise decisions, to become more mature, and to make decisions that we will have no regrets over. <clears throat> there are some things that I jotted down here that go in line with making those wise decisions. And the first one is this. 
Are we pursuing pleasure over holiness? There's a good question to ask ourselves. Somehow in our society today, and in the, even within the church, we have decided that if we're holy, we're not a happy people. I don't know where this came from. We should be the most joyful, happy people on the planet. Because why? Because we're living a life of holiness. We're living a life that is pleasing to God. And we're living a life where we're not making, we don't have regrets. But somehow we've, we've messed this up and we think holiness and happiness don't go together. But in actuality, they do. They go hand in hand with each other. So instead of making decisions that are going to lead us to regret, instead of making decisions that are based on emotions, that are based on our circumstances, that are based on some kind of lie, rather we're going to base them on who we are in Christ, on his word, on living that life of integrity and character that matters. It matters to us and it matters to the people around us. That freedom that comes from making those decisions based on holiness brings us a joy and a happiness that no one or nothing can take from us. The second one is this, and we talked about this briefly. Avoid making decisions based on your circumstances, but instead make them on your relationship with Christ. When we decide to make decisions that are based on our circumstances, we're basically shooting at a moving target. It changes. Your circumstances change all the time. What's happening here now, five minutes from now, now may be totally different. And so if we make this decision here, over here, guess what? We've missed our mark totally. We haven't even hit the target. Our circumstances will change. But when we're basing our decisions on our relationship with Christ, we don't have to worry. We don't have to fear because they're not being based on our circumstances, on our emotions. Paul in Philippians chapter 4 puts it this way, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. been thirsty. I've had all kinds of situations that happened in my life. Verse 13 of saying, I can do all things through him than me. So if we'll make our decisions based on Christ, based on and not our circumstances, we will make a wise decision. Number three, avoid making decisions based on a comparison. The comparison is a very dangerous one, and I'm here to tell you as a pastor, I'm as, I can fall into this trap as much as anyone else. And in our society today, where everything is based on social media, Facebook, Twitter, there's so many of them, I can't even think of all of their names. The young, you younger ones will know them. But we see that picture pop up on Facebook and we're like, oh, man, if I look like that, look at that house. Oh, my goodness. I would be so happy if I had a house that looked like that. 
Oh, my grands just remodeled their kitchen. Would you look at that? That is the kitchen of my dreams. We do it all the time. And if you're on Facebook or Twitter, you see it all the time. And somehow we get into this spot that the grass is greener on that side than it is where we're at. And in actuality, it's not. We have no idea what happened on their end. Because they're going to portray those things that are happy. Those things, they're not going to portray what's really happening in their life. Although some people do put that on Facebook. But they want to present their good side. One of the things that when Cynthia and I was talking to um, a, a lone person looking at a house, one of the things that he said was, well, you know, in today's technology, we can go and we can take pictures and do 3D videos of your home. And so you don't even have to be here to see it. We can do it. We can send it to you. You can base your decisions on this. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. And Cynthia's like, I don't think so. And so afterwards, after we hang up on this call, we're both like, there is no way on earth, A, we're using that person, and B, that we're going to do this. Because those of you who don't know, I'm kind of a picky person. And what you're going to show me is the perfect of everything. You're not going to show me the flaws. You're not going to show me all the stuff that I'm going to get there and be like, I hate it. But if we're saying we're buying it, now we're locked into a contract. So, no. No, thank you. I'm not doing that. We need to face our decisions on Christ. <laughs> we can't base it on what someone else looks at, what someone else thinks, what someone else has. You see, we're past our having to be a little bit different. Because for us, that comparison trap happens in, wow. Look at what that church has to do. Why can't we do that? Why is that church down the street running like 300 people and we're not? What are they doing that we're not? And we fall into this trap, and if we aren't careful, that will drive the things that we do, and we will try to become that church, and guess what? It's a failure because that was not what God intended for us to do. So we have to be careful in that. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, Paul says it this way. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to list things after that. After saying that, he says, our focus should be on those things that are true, those things that are honorable, those things that are right, those things that are pure, those things that are lovely, those things that are of good repute, those things that are of excellence, those things that are worthy of praise, these are the things you should dwell on. I shouldn't dwell on what my neighbor has. I shouldn't dwell on what my friend has. I need to dwell on what God has for me. It will make all the difference in my life. Number four, don't allow yourself to focus on yourself, but rather choose to focus on others. You see, when our focus comes on ourselves, we become prideful. We become selfish. Because it's all about us. And one of the secrets of Christendom and one of the things that we have is, is we are to focus on others. 
not on ourselves. And there's this passage in Hebrews that I love because I I love how whoever wrote Hebrews puts it. And it's found in Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 26. And they write this. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. What a great word. I love that. The easy thing for Moses to have done is to be like, I am the Pharaoh's son. I have everything at my fingertips. I need nothing. I have wealth. I have slaves. I have everything I need. I can sit and I can lay back and I will eat my grapes and people will do whatever I tell them to do. But I love how the writer in Hebrews puts that. That is not what Moses focused on. His focus was on. He was a Jew. He related to those who were in slavery. And because of it, he faced ill treatment. He chose God. He chose to run away from those things rather than pursuing the pleasures that sin would bring to him. When our focus is on others, and not on ourselves. There is a fulfillment and a joy that comes from pouring our, ourselves into the lives of others instead of just focusing on ourselves. Number five. Don't allow yourself to make decisions based on feelings, but rather base them on your faith in Christ. Our feelings are fleeting. We talked about that earlier. We can be all over the place emotionally. But when we're basing our decisions on God's truth, when we're basing them on our faith in Christ, there is an anchor there that will hold us. Despite what's happening around us, despite what our feelings are saying to us. We will not be led astray if we will do that. If we will bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, we would be a much better place to make wise decisions in our lives. In saying that, there's four questions that I wrote down here that I think would be good for us to ask ourselves. And in closing, I'm going to present these to you. The first one is, what does God's word say? What does the Bible say? We talked about this verse several weeks ago, but in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Hebrews 4.12 reminds us that the word of God is living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Woo! There's where we should be as believers. What does his word say? What does his truth say? Is my decision, is what I'm going to do, 
Is it based on truth or is it based on a lie of the enemy who wants to entrap me? Who wants to steal from me? Who wants to kill me? Who wants to destroy me? Or is it based on truth that's going to be bring me life and life more abundantly? So we need to seek that. What a great place for us to begin. And I know sometimes this is the last place we go to, but it should be the first place we go. Second, would someone wiser than me agree with my decision? It's wise to seek godly counsel. Proverbs 1 5 puts it this way A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. You have some wise people sitting here amongst you. So when you're struggling with a decision, Seek their counsel. Ask them. Ask someone in your life that you trust with your, everything you have and you know that that person is in God's word every day. They're going to base what they say to you on his word. In that case, seek their counsel. Number three. Will my decision glorify God. Is my decision going to bring him glory? Is my decision going to edify? Is it going to show that I'm a follower of Christ? Or is my decision based solely on selfish reasons? Is the decision I'm about to make, if someone, if my friend, if my family, if someone, my spouse, next to me, if I make this decision, is it going to help them draw closer to Christ, or is it going to lead them further away from Christ? I need to walk the walk and talk the talk. I should not say I'm a Christian and then be in the bar Monday through Saturday drinking or out sleeping with someone or doing something I shouldn't be doing when I know God's word says don't do it. So I need to make those decisions that will glorify him, that will draw people closer to him, not make them doubt, not make them wonder, not make them walk away. Because guess what? People are watching you. Whether you like it or not. Your kids, your grandkids, your spouse, your friends, they're watching you. The last question is, is the decision I'm about to make, how is it going to affect someone else. It kind of ties in to that previous question. We sometimes think that the decisions we're making is only going to affect us. Because we're so focused on ourselves, we don't realize that this decision is going to affect my spouse. It's going to affect my kids. It's going to affect my grandkids. It's going to affect those around me that love me and want only the best for me. So what is this decision I'm about to make? What is it going to say to my kids, to my grandkids? What's it going to say to my brothers and sisters? What's it going to say to my friends? 1 Corinthians, Paul says it this way in chapter 10. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Ne let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor.
How is my decision going to affect someone else? I know I've said a lot today, and I've struggled with how much is in here because it's a lot. But the bottom line that I want us to understand and take away today is this. The decisions that we make not only affect our lives, but they affect those around us. The easy thing to do is to base our decision on a lie, on something that is not truthful, on something that God's word says not to do. But it's not always wise to take the easy route. One of the, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the, Pilgrim, the Pilgrim's Progress, the new one um, that came out, I think, last year or the year before. Um, I really like it, actually. Um, the book was so hard for me to read, I struggled with it. But they really kind of made it in a way you can understand it in this, in this um, it's kind of a cartoon, sort of, in a way. But as Christian is taking his journey to the Holy City, he has all these hardships that he faces. He has these people that come up that try to lead him astray, to lead him away, to lead him into captivity. And he comes to this place where he can take the easy path or he can take the hard path. What a great metaphor for us. The easy path is not always the wisest thing to do because it can certainly lead us away from Christ. It can certainly entrap us. It can certainly lead to bondage. Not necessarily the easy. Not We need to be good stewards in the things that we do, the things that we just say, and the decisions that we make. So let me encourage you today. We have to make in life. Let me encourage you today. Seek Him. To lead. Is it going to lead us to Christ? Is it going to lead us away from Christ? To draw my family, my friends, my spouse to Christ, or is it going to lead them away? We need to base our decisions on God's truth. Not our feelings, not by comparison, not by our circumstances, but by His truth. Let's pray. Father, today I've tried to present this truth, and I don't know if I've done a good job. But Father, every one of us in this room have made good decisions, and sometimes we've made bad decisions. So Father, from today on, help us to make those decisions that are based on truth that are based on your word. 
those decisions that will glorify you, those decisions that will help draw people to you and not away from you. Father, will you help us to be the men and women of God you created us to be? Will you help us in all of the decisions that we're making today and in the future? Father, will you help us to make those wise decisions that are based on your truth? Father, will you go with us today? Will you help us? And Father, maybe there's some here this morning that are saying, I've not made some good decisions and I'm now in a place that I don't want to be. There's no better time than now to seek your face. There's no better time than now to ask for forgiveness and to make the decision that we are going to follow your truth. So Father, go with us. Help us to be your light in the darkness. Help us to be your representative to a community that desperately needs to know you. And Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory and the praise and the honor. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we ask all of these things. Amen and amen. Go in his peace and his grace.